What is going on guys, Vanity here, back with volume 14 of the In The Style Of series, this time reverse engineering the sound of Shlomo. This is the composition I'm going to be taking you through today. We'll start with reading Slomo's biography taken from Billboard.com. Avant-garde hip-hop producer and Los Angeles native Henry Lafer goes by the alias Shlomo. He started making music at the age of 14 and by 17 he was making cinematic beats in the same spirit as Flying Lotus, J-Rock and Raj G. In 2008, during his senior year of high school, he co-founded the Wedit Collective, an internet label and community of LA artists. Following the three EPs, Slow Fight, Camping and Palaces, and the mini album Slow Motion, Leifer released his first full length album in 2011 named Bad Vibes on Friends of Friends. Shlomo completed remixes for a variety of dance, indie, and hip hop and RB artists and collaborated with Banks and Jeremiah in 2014. He signed to True Panther Sounds in 2015, releasing the metal inspired Dark Red full length and touring with a band including fellow Wedit members. Moving on to his sound and signature style. Everything I'm about to speak about regarding Slow Mo sound is based around his Bad Vibes album. This, in my own opinion, was his best body of work. To sum it up, I've broken Slow Mo sound down into five pillars, which are as follows. Number one, his drums and percussion grooves are entirely made from found sounds and field recordings. These can consist of recordings of random household objects such as banging on wood for a kick, dropping a pair of keys for a snare, etc. These are just a couple of examples, but this production style does allow you to get pretty creative. It goes without saying, but his drum grooves for the most part are unquantized to your standard grids. Now Ableton does have a bunch of swing settings from the MPC that I recommend checking out. Number 2. Atmospheres or drones acting as the bed or foundation of the track. Without fail, there is a deep pad sitting at the bottom of the track, just tying all of the sounds in the mix together. Composing something in a minor or diminished chord progression will give you a similar sound. Now, I don't know what Shlomo uses, but you can definitely create similar sounds using Spectrosonic's Omnisphere and Native Instruments Absinthe. Because of the thickness of these beds of music, it does sound like a slight sidechain compression has been applied just to give the drum groove a bit of space in the mix. You may even want to take an atonal approach as many of Slomo's tracks don't have a tonal center. Number three. In many of his records, this is then paired with a guitar melody played in by Slomo himself. The chord structure is in most cases pretty similar to the pads and atmospheres, taking on that sad or emotional vibe. Number four. This one I found pretty interesting. There are no shortage of vocal tones sprinkled throughout the background of Slomo's records. Initially, I would have said that they were samples that had been manipulated, but after watching an interview in where he's recording his own voice through our Roland SP404, I would hazard a guess that this is the true source of those vocals. Number 5. The last pillar of Shlomo's sound is the use of everyday sounds in his records. These can include field recordings from public places, as well as animal and weather recordings. I do really like how Slomo incorporates everyday sounds that surround us in life and creates these complex and atmospheric pieces of music from them. Moving on to the equipment. This equipment section gets harder and harder with each artist I cover. Slomo uses Ableton combined with that Roland SP404 sampler I mentioned earlier. I've also seen him using a stylophone in a few of his interviews, but that's as much as I was able to find out. However, I do know that a lot of the producers involved in the LA beat scene also use the Roland SP404 for both producing and live performances. Let's dig into the composition. I'll start with the rhythmical element of this composition. We'll call them drums for now just to keep them simple, but really they're just a bunch of separate found sounds. Here's what they sound like all together.
They're made up from two separate elements. The first is the main beat, consisting of a kick, which is a bang on a table, and a snare, which is a twig snapping. Both of these sounds have been manipulated in their pitch, as well as various other elements into what you're now hearing. Here's what just the kick and the snare sound like together. The second element is the percussion groove that is made up from seven different found sounds. Some of the sounds in here come from spoons, whisks and chopsticks. Just random sounds that you can capture in most households. Here's what the percussion sounds like all together. Before I get into the processing, I'd like to say that all of these samples are from my Shlomo sample pack. The packs are currently drum hits only, but they are moving to full packs, complete with music loops, MIDI and presets, etc. very, very soon. This pack, however, is a little different. It's full of found sounds that can be used to create slow-mo styled rhythms. I had a lot of fun making the pack, and I've tried to separate them into the kind of drum hit they could be used for, so I hope you all enjoy. I've used a mix of Ableton and third-party plugins across this whole project. The first plugin I've got on the drum bus is an SSL channel strip from Universal Audio. I've mainly used this plugin as it's a new release and I was interested in testing it out. But I do really love the sound of analog emulations, especially on the drum bus. The next plugin is the glue compressor that comes bundled with Ableton. I've always really loved this compressor and I think it's greatly underestimated, perhaps because it's shipped with Ableton. But if you're not already, I recommend you all try it out. It works great on the drum bus too. I've then got this tape emulation plugin, which is essentially warming up the sound. I'm doing this by driving the input and then turning down the output to match. Ableton's built-in saturation plugin does a great job when used the same way. This is not something I can say for sure that Shlomo applies across his records, but it is something I'm always applying to my own drums and a touch on the master output. It just comes down to personal preference again. Give it a go, but make sure you turn the output down to match the input, otherwise you may think it sounds better when in fact it just sounds louder. The next plugin, Crap Cassette, is available for a free download. I've provided that link in the description for you guys. And it's just bringing in the sound of cassette into this mix. It's kind of funny, right, that through years of advancements in technology, digital audio processing is now born, yet we spend so much time trying to recapture that sound of tape and vinyl and bring it into our mixes. We do now, however, control how much dirt or noise is applied, but I still find that paradox amusing nonetheless. This plugin really isn't doing all that much. You can see that I've got most of the parameters turned right down. However, this control over here is what I'm most interested in, the tape age. And I think there's a misconception with the sound of vinyl and tape that they simply just add crackle or hiss onto the record. But many forget the effects of these mediums have on the actual dynamics and transients of the records. Without going in too much detail, the older the tape, the more frequencies will be lost. So the further you turn on this parameter, the more high and low end gets rolled off, giving you a close emulation to tape. Not just that, but it also softens the transients, just like the effects of real tape. This device also gives you the option of further tape effects, such as well, flutter, dropouts, and many more. I've provided an article in the description that goes into detail about analog warmth from sound on sound, and it's definitely well worth the read if you're looking to capture that in your own records. The last plugin on the drum bus is Vinyl, by Isotope, which is another free plugin that is again listed and linked in the description. This is just applying some of your typical vinyl characteristics across the drums, just some electrical noise and dust. The only other thing I've got going on on the drums is a bus reverb, so I'm sending the whole drum bus just to Ableton stock reverb. Just make sure that you change the quality to high right here. In order to create different spaces in a mix, it may be worth having a play with, say, three different reverbs in a track. So perhaps add a long and short plate reverb and a medium hall. 
Usually in a track, you'd want all the instruments in the same space, sounding as one, like they've all been recorded in the same room. Now, while this can be desirable for certain tracks, I think in this style of music, experimenting with more than one reverb could yield pretty interesting results. I didn't get that far with this composition, as it's only 16 bars long, but I wanted to mention it anyway. Moving on to the musical elements in this composition, which just consists of a guitar sample and a drone. Together, they sound like this. I've applied the same processing to each instrument, so I'll just go over it on the guitar. The guitar sample itself comes from an ambient sample phonics pack, which I've pitched down four semitones and rearranged slightly. As I mentioned towards the start of this tutorial, Shlomo will play in guitar riffs himself. I'd imagine just by jamming to the music he's already created, or maybe even start with the guitar itself. The first plugging on here is an EQ, just for moving everything under 100Hz. This EQ configuration has been applied to every single channel in this track, besides the 808 and the kick drum. It's more just to keep the mix clean and organised than for any creative reasons. Even though Shlomo's mixes are crowded, they don't sound messy. Everything that needs to be there is, nothing's clipping, the bass is there, etc. I'd actually recommend setting up a high pass filter on perhaps your favourite EQ as a default channel on Ableton. It certainly saves a ton of time. I've not removed 500Hz this time, as I wanted that mud or thick middle range frequencies present in this mix. I'm not going for a hollowed out mid-range but more of a full sounding track like slow-mo himself the next plugin is the ssl channel strip from universal audio again i was just trying this out so no other specific reason for picking it other than loving the sound of the ssl i'm just using it to boost the top end of the track around 4 db before i really get into arranging or applying any effects to samples i like to get them sounding good to me so that's what all these adjustments were for always start with a solid foundation the ssl is also applying some light compression around one decibel of gain reduction so nothing crazy at all the next plugin i'm using is the main compressor even though i don't use it all that much i do really like the glue compressor and i think it was added into ableton in version 9 and is actually modeled on the ssl2 i believe i'm also using ableton saturator for a reason i mentioned at the beginning of this track just turning up the drive and reducing the output to match just to make the sound a touch warmer again give it a try and see if you like how it sounds I've used more Ableton devices in this composition than usual. Now, when I'm using plugins by Universal Audio, Waves, DMG, etc., please do not think that you need these sounds in order to produce great mixes, because it's just not true. In fact, many of your favourite artists and the ones I've covered in this series just stick to using Ableton stock devices. Something I've spoke on in, I think, one of my early tutorials was to split up your creative and mixing days. When I'm putting together these compositions, and I'm in a creative flow state, I'll just go for the quickest options as I don't want to get bogged down in the mixing process as that can really hinder creativity, I feel. Now, the quickest options are just Ableton stock plugins. That's why you can see a lot of them still remaining on the track because I just really liked how they sounded and I didn't feel it necessary to replace them with plugins by Universal Audio, DMG or Waves. But try splitting up the days and see if it helps. The last plugin on here is just Ableton Standard Compressor, which I'm using to sidechain the kick and the snare to these two musical elements. As the drone is very thick in frequency, and I haven't really applied anything to really clean it up as I want that raw sound, the kick and the snare were getting a little lost. Even though Shlomo's mixes are very busy and full of sounds, the drum groove, whatever it may be made up from, is still very clear. I definitely think that he's using sidechain compression to achieve this, as it only has to be very slight, say a few dB, just to ensure that the transients of the drums poke through the thick bed of music. Worth mentioning too, I have also got this effect plugin on the drone. It's named Otto Biscuit 8 Bit Effects and is another plugin from Universal Audio that they've just recently released, and I'm again trying it out. I've got a couple of alternatives for you too, and they are Effectrix from Sugarbytes, which costs around £95 or $120. And a plugin named Glitch 2, which is the cheaper option, costing around £40 or $50. I cannot find any free alternatives, but I can do one better. While I was studying music at university, I was introduced to the world of Max for Life. 
Now, for those that don't know, it's a software application that runs in Harmony alongside Ableton and allows you to create your own plugins or devices to be used within Ableton. There is definitely a learning curve, but it's a very visual program. You won't have to be typing line after line of code. Now, I'm not suggesting you should be creating your own plugins from scratch, as that won't be of interest to everyone. But I am supposing that you can download and use for free plugins that other programmers have created via this website, maxforlive.com. Plugins can be expensive and not everyone has the finances or wants to spend it on plugins. I believe this could be a valuable resource to you all. Now you can see all the categories down the side here of plugins available for you to download. Let's look into the sample glitch category. You can see that you get a little preview of the plugin along with a description about what the device does. Now please bear in mind that some of the plugins won't be visually very appealing so don't let that put you off. But there are pages and pages of these, many that operate with the Ableton Push too. If you do find any plugins from this site that you do really like, drop a comment below so that other members of this community can download them too. I've linked a few that I personally really like in the pinned comment below, so I hope you enjoy them. Alright, moving on to the 808 bass in this track. I kept it very simple. I grabbed one of the 808 samples out of my 808 sample pack and just threw on one plugin. Here's how it sounds soloed. The utility device here is just reducing the volume of the sample as otherwise the input signal will be too hot for the next plugin. Too hot to really get the best out of it at least anyway. Gain staging is super important in mixing and is one of the biggest mistakes I see new producers making. With Ableton, the mixing failures are post-mix, meaning that they affect the volume of the sound after it's passed through the plugin chain down here. I don't believe that you can change the premix, so the utility plugin is essentially acting as a premix control. Now, I'm sure you guys have seen me using Max Bass from Waves. This is a similar device that Universal Audio have again just released, and again, I'm just trying it out. It's a subharmonic synthesizer, meaning it generates tones that are in line with the fundamental frequency of your original bass sound. As in every tutorial, I'm using it to provide an extra tone above the bass, higher in frequency than the original. This is so speakers that do not have the capability to reproduce sub-bass tones can still hear the tune and perhaps capture a little of the impact from the bass. Obviously, this all depends on how low your original bass tone is in the first place though. Moving on to the effects or the extra sounds in this composition, I'll just quickly run over some of the extra sounds and effects I've got going on in here. We've got the signature vinyl crackle and tape hiss. Now, this kind of goes without saying in a slow-mo record. I've then got a field recording of an airport terminal that I captured from my time in Toronto. This is how it sounds soloed. I've then got a shaker loop that I've time stretched around 400% and then added all of these plugins to. The reverb and dub delay are affecting the sound the most. This is how it sounds on its own. We've got another field recording of a cafe here that's been pitched up two semitones that I've chopped into two bar pieces and fade it in and out like so. I did this just so we've not constantly got a ton of sounds in the mix all at once. Bringing things out and then back in again just adds a layer of interest and variation. Here's how it sounds soloed.
Probably worth mentioning, I was walking around the cafe as I captured that, not just sat in one place. Pretty loud cafe as well. All of these field recordings, as I mentioned at the start of this tutorial, are one of the pillars to slow-mo sound, so don't sleep on using them in your own productions. Remember when I said towards the beginning of this video that slow-mo uses sounds that surround us daily that we are so used to hearing that they've been almost tuned out by the brain? This is why I've got this field recording of birds that again fades in and out. It sounds like this, soloed. So that was a rundown of every single sound in this composition. Let's move on to the mastering chain. We're starting the chain off with this EQ plugin, which is removing everything under 100Hz and boosting at 10kHz by 2 decibels on the sides of the record. Cutting low frequencies at the sides is just a practice I undergo just to clean up the stereo image of the track. And the boost at 10kHz just lifts the top end and provides some sparkle, which also sounds great on vocals. I'm always rolling off everything above between 13 kilohertz to 15 kilohertz as it neatens up the high end of a record. Also, if you turn your track way up on headphones, those high end frequencies can really start hurting your ears unless they are properly controlled. The BX control from Brainworks is converting everything under 250 hertz to mono, a standard practice for again clearing up any loose ends in the low end. I'm also boosting the stereo width of the track by 25%, which is kind of self explanatory. The next plugin is just a tape emulation, which I'm basically just running my track through. To to get some of the warmth out of it. I'm doing this by cranking up the input, but as you can see, only very slightly, and turning the output down to match. It's very subtle, but it does have a nice smoothing effect on the whole track. The Shadow Hills compressor, I mean, what can I say? It would be a crime to own this plugin and not use it on the master output. It's took me years to finally take the plunge and acquire the UAD plugins, and this one I've wanted for a long time. You can definitely master a track without any fancy plugins, but you cannot without the knowledge. The two next plugins are the PSP Old Timers, one compressing the mids and one the sides. This video has already gone way longer than I expected, but I'd still like you guys to learn about mid-side processing if you're not already. I will make a separate video covering it, but for now I've got a link to a sound on sound article in the description for you all to check out. Hopefully it makes the mid-side subject a little clearer. The last plugin on here is the L2 limiter from Waves. I'm using it to level the track to around 10 decibels while taking off a few dB on the gain reduction meter. I've left 0.2 decibels of headroom for any intersample peaks that may occur on the listener's end. Moving on to the last segment, the key takeaways. The first is the five pillars of slow-mo sound. You can skip back to them below in the pinned comments containing the video chapters. I just want you to hear them again and remember them. Number two is the field recordings and found sounds. Even outside of slow-mo sound, incorporating field recordings and found sounds into your composition is great fun and it's something I think really improves the creation of music production. Number three is the Max for Life plugins. Remember to download a bunch and leave any recommendations in the comments below. That's all I've got for you today guys, if you did enjoy this video I would highly appreciate it if you could like the video and subscribe to the channel if you'd like to see more of these tutorials. I'll catch you all in next week's tutorial on Jamie XX. The amount of people that have requested this is insane, but I'm going to make sure I deliver for you guys. Until then, I'm out. Peace.